Hey everybody, it's uh, Richard. Amber won't be making it today, so she gave me her credentials and I logged in and I'll be running the webinar. Good afternoon to you all. Hello, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, hey Josh. Hey guys. Can you hear me as well? Yes. Hi Richard. Thank you for hosting us. Absolutely. There might be a, a few of me there because I gave the link to my team. Okay, cool. <laughs> so I, I, I'm not duplicating myself. Thanks for doing this today. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm a, a small part of uh, Victor's presentation, but um, I'm really excited <laughs> to be here. <laughs> cool. Oh, so you have a presentation? Well, there's slides. Oh, wow. Look at that. Okay. Yeah, this is great. I Basically, uh, Amber isn't feeling well at the last minute, and she said, uh, Richard, would you jump in? I was like, yeah, sure. I was going to attend anyway. So um, yeah, this, this is good. Awesome. Awesome. Can you uh, see my screen now or? Yes. Okay. Did you guys happen to do the attack uh, conference that was held by by um, Freddie Dezur for the EU uh, Monday and Tuesday? I did not. No. No, I didn't either. It was it was um, two days, about six hours per day, fifteen minute, maybe a few thirty minute, uh, all lightning talks, just a never ending succession of Can you see my screen? Can you see my slides? <laughs> <laughs> just over and over again. <laughs> But it was good. It was, you know, it was good content. And I, the 15 minute, uh, the format was actually pretty good. Um, my wife said maybe there should be a conference called QuarterCon where it's just quarter hour talks nonstop. Oh, yeah, that would be interesting. <laughs> yeah, the idea was just to get people familiar with the topic and say, hey, here's, we're doing this thing. Here's a few things it can do. If you want to know more, here's my contact information. Next person, basically. Yeah, almost like a virtual poster session. Yes, yes. Are you familiar with the uh, Pecha Kucha concept? No, what's that? So I think this originated in um, uh, architecture world, like more in design and stuff. Um, so they have a concept where you have um, a, a fixed amount of slides and each slide is shown to the screen um, at, on the screen a fixed amount of time and then you have to talk. Uh, and so you cannot pause it or anything um, and then I think it's max seven minutes or something. I, I don't remember the details, huh. uh, but I've attended many of them. It's mostly about design and art and, and things, but it's it's a very interesting format. It's very fa fast paced. Sometimes it goes ho horribly wrong and it's, yeah. it's very fun. Yeah. I remember one of the few sort of lightning sessions I ever did was at um, Cansac West and it was the five minute lightning talk series. And there were some people who they spent the entire five minutes trying to get their laptop working and then they never <laughs> did. And then they're like, next, gone. <laughs> <Oops>. <laughs> yeah, that sucks. Probably all nervous and yeah, pre well, preparing it and everything. This was yeah. phew, probably like 2004. So, you know, the AV equipment was still a little bit shaky back then. <laughs> All right. Well, wow. We have a great, we have a great group with us today. It's two Oh one. So I think let's, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon or in morning or evening, uh, depending on where you're located. Um, usually Amber Graner from Corelight, uh, the, the community manager for Zeke uh, runs these, but she's not feeling well. So she asked me to jump in at the last minute. So I'm Richard Baitlick. I'm uh, one of Amber's colleagues at Corelight. And today we are really pleased to have two friends from the Suricata community, uh, Victor and Josh, with us today. And they even prepared a presentation, which I was just going to attend this and enjoy it. But now I realize, wow, I, have a present, you know, I can watch a presentation as well. So uh, with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to, to you guys. And um, I guess I'll, we'll just hold questions to the end. And if you have a question, you know, feel free to put it into one of the many chat options we have it looks like on the right here 
Um, but I guess that's probably the easiest way for you guys to maintain your flow and then we'll get to the, the questions at the end. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you, Richard. Uh, and thank you for hosting us uh, uh, in, the, in the Zeek uh, community. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting to not play a home match uh, for a while. Usually I speak at Suricon, which is a Suricata event. Um, so uh, I, we wanted to talk a bit about Suricata, about where we came from, where we are and where we want to go. And um, uh, near the end, I have some ideas about how to uh, improve collaboration between Suricata and Zeek as well. Um, uh, but first let's kind of assume that some people uh, listening and, and watching are not all that familiar with Suricata and, and kind of go through that. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm one of the founding members uh, of, of the OASF of, uh, and the original creator of Suricata. Um, currently still leading the development effort, which means a mix of uh, actually writing code, lots of review and uh, leading the development team. Uh, you can see my uh, uh, Twitter and, and everything on the, on the slide. And then we have Josh on the call. And can you introduce yourself, Josh? Yes, uh, thank you, Victor. Um, uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, I have uh, joined OASF and the Circata Project as the Director of Training and uh, broadly as Outreach. I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, been with OISF now for, I think, about two years. Uh, the time has gone, certainly gone fast, and it's been a great experience. Uh, you can see some contact information, um, and then uh, I do some other uh, security work outside of uh, this, uh, including some university professoring and, and some threat research. Thanks, uh, Josh. <clears throat> so uh, first, very, very basic, uh, what is Suricata? Um, so we are um, an IDS engine uh, an I IPS engine, and, and we call ourselves an NSM uh, network security monitoring engine. Um, so what we pretty much do is we take signatures or rules, we kind of use those two terms uh, uh, in a mix. Um, we have scripting um, and we have protocol parsers and decoders and uh, using those things, we generate logs, uh, we can issue blocks like in an IPS setting, we can block traffic, uh, we can extract files and generate things like PCAPs. Um, uh, I see an incomplete slide, that's, uh, that's nice. Um, so Suricata is implemented using uh, both C and Rust uh, and, and I'll talk more about the Rust side later. Uh, it started out as C. Um, it's multi-threaded and it's multi-threaded through a um, uh, setup of parallel packet pipelines. So we have really nice scaling uh, in, in the threading. If you need, if you have more cores, you just spin up more threads and then you get more throughput. That's sort of the, the, the short story. Of course, the reality is a bit more complicated, but uh, that's sort of where we are. Um, and then there's scripting using Lua, Lua JIT. Um, what should have been here is uh, we, the signature rule language that we uh, use has been uh, derived from the snort language um, and uh, but has been been evolving evolving into our own uh, variant our own dialect so to speak so i don't know if this is a question that i need to bring to you why the network um, but i wanted to bring it up anyway why we care about the network um, so in general the network doesn't lie uh, you can observe the network and the packets that are there are really there. Um, and even though actors may try to confuse you or maybe may try to, uh, to fool you, it's, it's, it's a place where, where you can still find uh, truth or facts. Um, everything is networked uh, these days, almost everything. Um, and most attacks have some kind of network components. Um, maybe uh, just the command and control after a successful attack, maybe the attack itself, maybe both, um, but the network is almost always a part of it. Uh, and the network can still be reliable, even if the end hosts or the endpoints are compromised, you can still uh, trust that the network is traffic that you see is, is real, is, is, uh, is telling you <clears throat> the truth. Sorry. So how would you use Suricata? I think most people will use it uh, passively as an IDS. Um, so as a 
listening on a spam port or a tab and then um, generating alerts and then uh, some analyst or group of analysts will be acting on those alerts uh, or, or other data that, uh, that Suricata produces. Um, Suricata can also run uh, actively as IPS. Uh, they're kind of different models. Uh, the, the one uh, I think most used is probably as a transparent bridge, which is um, uh, at the layer two. But you can also integrate with uh, Linux and IP tables or NF tables or uh, with uh, FreeBSD and um, IPFW to integrate into a firewall rule set and then it will be more in, in a router setup where uh, uh, it's more layer three. Um, <clears throat> there's a hybrid form as well where you can have something like uh, 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 the IDS sits on the side but tries to do session sniping by injecting reset packets and such. Um, uh, I don't think that's used very much but there, uh, it's, it's sort of a hybrid form. Um, and then finally which is more for analysts, I, I think, and threat researchers. Uh, lots of, you can do PCAP analysis in various ways. You can just run Suricata on a file, just like you can do with Seek or, or Snort or uh, TCP DOM. Um, <clears throat> you can run it on a directory or you can have a special Unix socket mode where it's, um, where Suricata is sort of like a server and you throw um, uh, PCAPs at it and it will spit back the, the logs. Um, that's more for a large amount of PCAP processing. So uh, um, this is a slightly um, uh, out of character for me to kind of be bragging a bit, but um, these days uh, it's, it's almost like when someone tells me like, oh, did you know that this or that company uses Suricata? I'm not surprised anymore. And, and that's very different from say five years ago and, and, and definitely from before that where um, we were really excited if some big companies started using Suricata and now I'm almost assuming that they are um, and, and, uh, and in many cases this is true. So we, we, we talked to very, very, very big companies uh, in, in, in all kinds of industries that are using Suricata and, um, and often directly and then of course many of the commercial appliances uh, uh, integrate Suricata and, and people may be using it without really realizing. Uh, there's a great uptake in, in the open source space as well, where you have the, the, the PF and OpenSense, you have Security Onion, you have Selks and, and the other NSM uh, distros that create um, uh, an, a, a bigger experience where Suricata is, is, is a component, sometimes a default one, sometimes an optional one. And other parts are also there, like for example, uh, Zeek is, is part of uh, uh, Security Onion and uh, I think also Rock NSM and maybe others. Um, <clears throat> so enough about that. So who is behind Suricata? That's, uh, um, I think this is really where, where our story is, is quite different from very many other open source projects. Um, so uh, we are, uh, all part of a foundation called uh, the OISF or the Open Information Security Foundation. Uh, <clears throat> the OISF has been created uh, uh, back in 2009 um, to guide and govern uh, Suricata to receive funding for it and to make sure that it has a safe, <clears throat> a safe home and a stable home. Um, it is uh, the, the, the uh, the foundation uh, is, is where the funding comes in and, and it's also where the money flows out towards developers and uh, development in general. Um, the code of Suricata is almost completely owned by the OASF um, and that has a reason which is that we also realize that uh, commercial uh, entities want to be able to have uh, uh, Suricata integration into their commercial products and <clears throat> since Suricata is open source under a GPL2 license this is not always uh, uh, possible through the license and so because OSF is uh, the owner of the code we can give um, uh, more liberal licenses to these uh, entities uh, in exchange for them joining our consortium and uh, uh, helping support the development of Suricata. And so this is basically how we've operated for the last uh, decade, I suppose. Um, and uh, I will talk a bit more about funding later. So we are a virtual team. Um, 
we have people in the US, in Canada, France, Sweden, Netherlands, uh, that's me, uh, India, Germany, and um, oh, I, I mentioned France already. Uh, so we have no two people in, in one location. Um, so we are a very much a virtual team. We don't meet a lot and uh, definitely not right now in the current circumstances. So it's really a lot of uh, a chat and, and other um, uh, calls and such. Uh, the only thing that's really a trouble uh, with this is, uh, is of course time zones. Uh, but so far, I think we're the, the most east person and our most west person, person, if that's how you say it, is are about 12 hours apart, I think. So it's, it's doable, uh, but it's sometimes tricky. So I wanted to give a short history of uh, Suricata. And uh, it starts with naming. Um, so the initial name of Suricata uh, or the code base that became Suricata was VIPS. Um, and uh, that was Victor's IPS. And pretty much it was an effort, effort by me to just learn a bit about uh, multi-threading and packet forwarding and all these things. Um, I had been a contractor in the Snort world for some time. I had not worked on Snort officially for uh, Sourcefire at the time, but I had worked for other companies that used uh, um, Snort in their appliances and such. So I thought like, I know something about this and, and maybe I can create something. I hadn't really, didn't, it wasn't really a big plan, like what it turned out to be uh, today, but it, it was, you know, a nice research project. Um, so I met Matt Youngman and Will Metcalf in early 2008 in, um, in, uh, in California uh, for a conference and uh, I showed them kind of what I was working on. It, was, it wasn't really, wasn't much, um, but they got really excited and the three of us kind of started dreaming about what it could become. And then we happened to meet the right person uh, at the right moment in a Danny's restaurant, I think it was, uh, very close to the Yahoo campus. I, I heard it's gone now, it's kind of a shame. Um, and he put us in touch with someone else uh, and then suddenly we were on the path to DHS funding uh, for creating an IDS engine. And, uh, you know, we thought like that's a couple of years work maybe. Uh, and now we, here we are, I think 12 and a half years, years later. Um, so the, the VIPS name was obviously temporary. Um, if you, by the way, if you check our Git history, uh, uh, it's still in there. Um, so the early commits are still uh, showing the VIPS name. <clears throat> um, but it was clearly a, a, a temporary name, but so what would we pick? So our background was all of us came from the, from the Snort community. Uh, Matt uh, was doing Bleeding Snort, which then became Bleeding Edge and at some point became emerging threats. Um, and I think at the time it was already emerging threat. So um, we were thinking, well, we want this engine to do a bunch of things that were that emerging threats wanted to do, but it didn't really work very well with, uh, with Snort for them. So we thought, well, we want to make specific features uh, uh, in, in this engine to support uh, the emerging threats rule set. Um, but the question was, should we really tie the project, the engine to this, uh, to, to emerging threats? And we went back and forth a bit, but ultimately decided that we shouldn't uh, do this. And that's where we started to look for a new name. Uh, and, and we found a mascot first, uh, the meerkat. Um, uh, and then we figured, wow, the genus name of the meerkat is Suricata and we kind of liked it. And, so if you go into the Git history, you will see a commit on the 21st of December, 2009, uh, renaming the whole thing to Suricata. So to this day, my main working tree still is a directory called emerging IDPS or I, um, which is something I kind of hold on to as a joke. So originally what we wanted was, um, so where we came from, I mentioned this, we were all part of the Snort ecosystem. So Will and I had met through his work on Snort Inline. Snort Inline at the time was a fork of Snort 
um, which was created by someone I don't remember the name of right now. Um, and he took SNORT and wanted to create, turn it into an IPS, which at the time wasn't part of the SNORT project itself. Um, and Will had taken over from this previous person uh, and, and uh, I had interest in firewalls and such and I came across this SNORT in line and I tried it and it didn't work the well, as well as I wanted. So I sent an email to Will like, hey, your code is broken uh, and uh, the rest is history, so to speak. Um, but so this IPS thing is what share what Will and I kind of shared, and Matt's never been a big IPS person. Um, but so the emerging threats and the rules was more what what uh, Matt's um, uh, influence was that he he came from this rule angle. So I think that was actually a pretty good mix uh, between the three of us. Um, so the initial goal was to build a multi-threaded IDS engine that can apply SNORT rules and especially the, um, the, the emerging threats rules. Um, and especially uh, the type of emerging threats rules that, uh, that Matt and this, uh, the community around uh, emerging threats wanted to create. So that's what we set out to do. And, and uh, I'll, I'll talk about the funding, but um, just a, a, a small tip, never promise a release by the end of the year because we literally did the release, like I think two hours before midnight on New Year's Eve. And uh, that was uh, uh, a very, very stupid idea. Everyone was worn out after the holiday season and, uh, and no one actually cared because you know it was the holiday season. So no one's, one was gonna actually look at your code. Um, I mentioned the OASF. So um, uh, Matt actually uh, set out to set up the, the foundation. Um, it's, uh, it's still headquartered or uh, how do, I don't know the proper word, but it's still in uh, Lafayette, Indiana, where Matt lives. Um, and um, even though the, the, how do you say, I forgot the words, but it's, it's a uh, main address is now in Boston, but it's, uh, it's technically still a Lafayette, Indiana foundation. Um, <clears throat> Its uh, goals were to keep the community central in this project um, and to avoid a scenario where, you know, you have like a, a, an open source project and some big company steps in and, and buys the company or the organization behind the open source project or hires away all the developers and then, you know, the community is sort of left uh, in the dust. Um, we also wanted it to be a nonprofit so that we would really put all the money that we would raise into the development and uh, uh, in, in building the community and the product. And so we decided to form the Open Information Security Foundation and uh, it's, uh, a, a one, it's a nonprofit uh, in the US. So I, I mentioned this, uh, the, that we kind of through luck and then uh, a hard work by Matt mostly uh, were able to land seed funding. Um, so the Department of Homeland Security in the, in the US funded the first two or so years uh, of, of the development of Suricata. And, and this was really the thing that we needed. Uh, we had dreamed a bit about doing something like this, but never could figure out how we would fund it. And uh, this was really what jump started it for us. Uh, we also knew that this was going to be uh, a, uh, a temporary uh, uh, funding. Uh, it wasn't going to last, so we needed to think about how to support ourselves. And uh, so I mentioned this license thing through the, the uh, OSF consortium. Um, and later on, we've also added training and support services and, and uh, we've been getting some, some funding through research grants and, and professional services uh, as well. I think I'm going a bit too slow. Um, so at first we were developing what, what we uh, sort of, uh, sort of a classic IDS uh, concept. So um, the idea of, of having some kind of rule set and then having traffic and uh, combining these and then you get uh, 
you get an alert and, and that's sort of what the function was. Um, I've always taken a bit of offense by, with the term of IDS where the system, the S stands for system, I, I feel like tools like Snort and Zeek and Suricata are not systems in, in, in this sense, but more like engines to be used as part of a larger system. Of course, you can use Suricata standalone and some people do, the same is true for the other tools, but it's it, the, the, the most value is, is gained by using it as a part of a larger, larger system. So I, I call Suricata an IDS engine. Um, so we, it, it captures traffic, reconstructs state, and then inspects this state for anomalies and poli policy violations. And these policy violations are defined by rules or signatures. Um, as a rule lang, because of our, um, where we came from, we, we picked the snort language um, and, and uh, implemented the subset, the things that we cared about. And then of course, uh, as, as you develop things, it starts to diverge and it become, became a superset as well. Uh, it's still a subset superset sort of thing where we don't implement everything that SNORT does, and um, but we also implement a lot of things that SNORT doesn't. So it's kind of, we, we've gone our own direction. So I was hoping Richard would be on the call. I, I don't know, Richard, if you have seen, if you've spotted your book yet behind me. Um, so uh, the NSM term, network security monitoring was, was uh, introduced to me by the book by Richard and probably maybe before that his blog post. Um, it That's was, funny, Victor. I, I was wondering, because that, that scheme is used by a couple of other Pearson books. So I tried to zoom in, I couldn't quite tell, but thank you, I appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> yep, it's, it's there. I, I double checked it, it would be visible. <laughs> um, uh, so so I, I don't think Richard did, that you claim to have invented the NSM term, but uh, that I, I definitely think you've popularized it. Um, yeah, Todd and, Heberlein, he, he's the guy who invented it. Ah, okay, well. Um, so I think my view of it, at, at least as it applies to Suricata, is that it, it proposes a much more holistic view uh, of what network security is or security in general. And that the alert-centered uh, workflow that people had before that were not sufficient uh, and, and um, more more is needed. And I think for Suricata, what, what, we, what we started doing is um, extending the functionality to pretty much log everything that Suricata um, sees. Like if Suricata sees it, why wouldn't we be able to log it? Uh, and then uh, this applies to, to like higher level constructs like the transactions in protocols and PCAPs and, and such. And the goal is to provide lots of metadata and context to alerts, but also to feed uh, uh, tools like uh, um, seams and, and other post-processing tools to be able to do uh, higher level anal analysis. Um, so as a side effect, I think one of the nice things is that it actually also led us to enrich the alerts. So I don't know if ever, any of you has ever looked at a as, as at a fa fast log uh, a line, it, it contains very, very little information. You usually have like the five tuple and you have the signature ID and pretty much that's all the unique information that's in there. Um, the rest can be derived from the signature itself. And, and uh, so it's, it's very, very little to go by. Uh, so on, on my slide here, I've pasted a, 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 a simple example of what we have now where you see the actual alert uh, and with, with the signature ID and some information, but then also the, uh, the, the HTTP object and, and the flow as at the moment that the alert was raised to the flow state. And um, so we have this for most of the protocols that Zircad understands have much more context and metadata. And uh, we're constantly working on improving that. So a big thing for us was uh, what we have named Eve, which is our uh, sort of fire hose JSON output for almost everything. Um, and one of the things I really want to point out is that this is now one of the major features of Suricata, but it started out as a community contribution, in this case by Tom DeCanio, who was, I believe, still at the time at Mpulse, but maybe he was already at FireEye, because FireEye bought that company. Um, but um, 
it, it is, and, and I'll give a more, another example later, one of the things that for us is, is, is a key is that the community through contributions and also through ideas can really uh, dramatically change the direction of, of our project. So, <clears throat> because we were part of that all um, uh, SNORT ecosystem, we supported that Unified 2 format, which led to using Barnyard and databases and web GUIs like BASE. And, and so if you wanted to add something to, a, uh, to an output, then all of these steps would have to be updated. And now with the JSON format, we could just add it and we were done. It would be usable in Kibana or Splunk or whatever your post-processing is because uh, JSON is, is so flexible. The second big thing <clears throat> where we um, uh, um, see the community contribution is, is around our use of Rust. So Rust um, came to us through uh, Pierre Chiffier who is uh, a French uh, developer and, and uh, uh, security tinkerer and thinker and uh, overall just a great guy. And he did a talk at Suricon and he, he proposed something bold. He said, well, you know, you, you guys write C code and, and, and that's wrong. Uh, why don't you use Rust? And uh, he was completely expecting us to reject him. Um, but we actually decided that, he, that what he said made a lot of sense. It, took a bit of time, but overall we were very uh, positive about it. Um, you can still get his slides uh, from, from his presentation. It's very, very interesting still. And our conclusion was that we would start using Rust, um, not convert the whole project over, uh, but um, uh, convert uh, it step by step. And uh, I'll get to that uh, later. Um, so Rust has a number of great properties. Rust. Um, presents itself as a fast systems programming language uh, that is memory safe. Um, and um, it has some great properties, like if it compiles, it usually works. I mean, you can still make logic errors, but you won't get create buffer overflows, for example. Um, if it fails, it fails predictably. And everyone, anyone working with C knows that, you know, it, it's, you make a small mistake somewhere and then uh, two hours later, your program crashes and it's impossible to figure out why. Um, or at least very hard. And Rust makes it much easier because if it finds some, some, something it disagrees with, it just panics right away and you can analyze it much quicker. Um, and Rust is very fast. It's um, in some cases even faster than C because it, it, um, it, it's more optimized in, uh, it, it provides more building blocks that are optimized than, than C does. Um, it's also sometimes slower than C, uh, so your mileage might vary, but for us it's been fast and fast enough uh, in general. It has some, uh, some, some drawbacks too, uh, like for uh, if you introduce a second language uh, into your code base, it's definitely something that complicates things. Uh, also the compiler itself is quite slow, uh, learning Rust is quite hard, um, uh, and, and, but we see that it's uh, it's really improving and, and lots of people are actually trying to learn it. Um, my biggest problem with Rust so far is that I find the ecosystem quite in, immature, which you fi uh, find lots of packages like uh, crates as they are called in Rust, uh, in the Rust world that are not very mature that break after updates and things like that. So um, it's not a perfect thing, but it's definitely uh, a, a great step forward for us. Um, we don't think that Rust is going to completely replace our C code anytime soon, but we do set, have, have a goal of replacing all handling of untrusted input um, by Rust code. And um, that's going to take a while. Uh, we are currently, I think, at 7% of our code base is Rust. Uh, it jumped from 6 to 7 today because I merged uh, one, one conversion uh, pull request. And I, I suspect that by the time Suricata 6 com, comes out in about two months, we'll be at about 10% because we have a, a fairly large number of pull requests waiting uh, that introduce more Rust. Um, so these are two features, the Eve output and, and the Rust, um, Rust uh, language that are really 
have really dramatically changed the, the, the direction of the project. Um, but there are many, many other things that have been cont contributed completely or partly by community members that um, are uh, uh, there that either changed the direction a bit or have really enriched the program. And so the list here is is uh, what we, what I came up with in about two hours or so. It's probably not complete, and it's definitely not um, ha having all the smaller contributions in all kinds of ways. But as you can see, this is these are really significant contributions. Uh, entire protocol parsers or important protocols, uh, VXLAN, for example, as something that you need for uh, using a circuit in AWS and, and things like that. So it's really those are really significant features, um, and and um, that's also what I want people to to know really about our project is that we are not this group of visionaries that just create these these magical things or or no no best or anything it's it's quite the opposite we really need the input of people and contributions and ideas by the community the people who actually run suricata in real environments and that's really where i think uh our project has been uh has been starting to to succeed uh a major portion of that uh, uh, interaction is, is uh, at Suricon. So we have done, I think now five Suricons. So this is our annual conference and um, uh, it's a three day conference and uh, one, uh, about half a day of that is a, is a brainstorm session with, with everyone in the, in the community who is interested. And, and we talk about what the priorities are, what the pain points are, what we need to improve, what we're missing uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's um, very, very useful. Uh, very short thing. Uh, we do developer trainings. We haven't done a, one in a while, but it's been a great driver for me personally. Uh, if I have to teach something and I, I, I'm sitting in the class and I'm saying like, this is just so stupid, then I'll, I'll change it right after the training. So some of the major refactoring has been happening because of the dev training. Um, so kind of wrapping up the, the history, um, there's of course mistakes and, and regrets and, and things like that. Um, uh, so I think for too long we focused on staying close to the, the, the snort language and tooling um, and uh, uh, kind of maybe didn't really feel confident to kind of go our own way. Uh, and, and now that we've done that, I think it's, it's much easier. Um, for for us and and the tooling is much more focused on Suricata and you you don't use pull pork anymore with, with Suricata you use Suricata update which actually really integrates really well and things like this so I, I added it added lip magic just for Seth uh, I hope he's on the call uh, because I, I listened in on last week's call uh, with the, the experts and uh, I remember Seth recommending me to not touch lip magic and uh, yes he's right I regret it um, recently, I think we've seen a lot of improvement in all kinds of QA efforts, uh, recently, meaning a few, a couple of years. Um, I wish we had had many of those things earlier in the project. I think we've wasted much time on just uh, chasing our own tail, fixing this bug, reopening the other one, and then fixing that and vice versa. Um, so having proper CI and things like that has really helped and I wish I had it for uh, uh, sooner. Um, JSON output is great, um, kind of because we already had some JSON in the in the project, we used uh, Lib Jansen, which we used for, for uh, the other JSON that we uh, already had. Lib Jansen is a great library, but it's not really a, what, a good fit for what we do, which is high speed uh, output of JSON. Like, um, so in, in our next version, we're going to replace that. Um, and, but it's a small sort of regret. A bigger issue is the Lua output. So Lua is our scripting language of choice. Um, and especially Lua JIT has, was the reason for choosing Lua. Lua JIT is uh, apparently no longer maintained or very, very uh, minimally maintained. There is 
apparently a fork uh, or, or another implementation. Um, it's, it's kind of, uh, I, I kind of regret that we went the Lua way, although it made sense at the time for us to not do something like what Bro or Zeek did was invent its own language. Uh, and, uh, and lots of security tools at the time were doing things around Lua, um, uh, like Nmap and, and Snort and Mod Security and Wireshark and such. So I think I can still understand why I chose it, but right now we're kind of thinking how we get ourselves out of this hole. Um, we've spent quite a bit of time on um, trying to get CUDA to really do something for us. Uh, CUDA was, uh, is the GPU offload uh, for NVIDIA cards. Uh, was promising in academic research for uh, pattern matching offload. It never really delivered for us, which may be our own fault um, for never really pushing through, or maybe it was just not feasible. Um, I've, academic research suggests that it's possible, uh, real world, not so much. So, uh, but we spend a lot of time on it and sometimes had to re-architect things around it and, and ultimately we ended up removing it anyway. And uh, I'll skip the last one. Uh, I talk too much, I'm sorry. Um, so some of the struggles that we have are that we as a team have limited visibility in actual deployments. We don't have lots of customers where we go on site and see how Zerk kind of works. Uh, for them. So uh, we are depending a lot on community feedback. Uh, we did start a support services program and in this support services program, we, we are starting to get a bit of this feedback uh, and that's really helpful. Uh, we are planning to build our own QA lab. Um, uh, the whole Corona thing kind of uh, put that on hold, but as soon as uh, that's uh, kind of under control, we'll restart that. Um, some struggle that, that I really have is, and I think maybe this is something that, that uh, the people of Zeek also may recognize, is the question of what is Suricata? Is it a product? Is it used, is it an end user product? Or is it a technology uh, more meant for integration and, and, and hiding it from, from the end user? And the question I think is important because you have limited development resources and then you, you start focusing them on uh, on you know polishing the, the end user experience or experience or maybe you polish uh, or you focus on, on improving some other integration uh, uh, path and I think what we also suffer from there is is what I call power user bias is that the people that you communicate with a lot in your community are essentially the power users and, and they don't really represent the community they represent like the power users and not necessarily the, the average users. So this is something that I'm still sort of thinking about quite a bit and, and probably is true for other projects too. Uh, encryption, uh, I don't really wanna call it a struggle. It's more a challenge. Uh, I think uh, protocols closing up and, and encryption getting more uh, widespread is in general a very good thing. Um, it also closes some attack factors like packet injection uh, becomes much less feasible in, in a proper work, properly working encryption session. Um, but of course it leads to less visibility um, and, and this is uh, something that, that in, in an IDS world is something we'll, that we'll have to adjust to. So we have several approaches. Uh, we focus more on enterprise networks where encryption is much less uh, uh, present yet. Uh, we can integrate with decryption tooling, um, get more value out of TLS streams themselves. Uh, statistical analysis is something that we're exploring. Um, we, you can also focus on the very, very long tail of all kinds of protocols that actually are not encrypted and all kinds of devices that will not be updated and all these things. Um, another approach is focusing on validation of the use of encryption. So are the cipher suites in, in order? Uh, do you see unencrypted traffic from a host that should only uh, talk encrypted, et cetera? And I think we can also work on, on feature generation for machine learning systems uh, as well. I'll skip this for uh, time reasons. I think one other thing I, I wanted to mention that's been on my mind recently is, is um, 
being a good open source citizen as an open source project is, is something that I'm uh, uh, thinking about. And um, so if you're, if you're open source, should your tooling also be all open source? And I, I don't mean you know, to produce the actual result, uh, but also the tooling that you use in your team and your community. And um, so in the Circada and OESF case, we, we have a mixed, a mix, I think like most people will, most projects will have. Like, for example, today we are using Zoom, which is uh, a definitely a closed platform. Um, this, this, this deck is being presented from, from uh, Google's uh, G Suite, which is also a clo closed platform. We use GitHub and such. And um, uh, one of the things where it came up lately is, is, is around things like chat. Do we switch from something that's open like IRC to something like that's closed like uh, Slack? Um, and uh, it, it's, 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 I think this is quite challenging and, and it's probably good to some, have somewhat of a balance. Uh, although I'm, I'm probably in my group, the, the person most, uh, 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 how do you say this? most strict about trying to be as open as possible in, in our tooling. Um, I'm going to skip this and um, Josh can talk. Okay, um, I'll go quick here. Um, I have a couple slides, but I think in the interest of time, um, I'll try to just condense it down uh, as, as most of the things I wanted to touch on are really contained here in this slide. Um, as uh, my, my title suggests, uh, I, my focus is on training, which uh, as Victor had mentioned earlier is, is a you know, part of our funding. So it's a very important um, you know, objective for us in terms of balancing, getting things out to the community and also providing that support for, for continued development. Um, the other is outreach, and uh, and I can I can kind of lump that under you know either academic outreach or other kinds of outreach, such as um, doing webinars and, and workshops. Um, I see there's a couple of questions uh, about um, you know getting more into the community, and, and so that's uh, you know another real big effort that uh, we've been trying to put into and, and struggled with um, over the last couple of years and, and going into the future. Um, in terms of, of just looking academically, that has been an area that do we are trying to grow. Um, we have Suricon, which is our, our annual user conference. Uh, we've been doing things like poster sessions as well as um, starting to explore the use of scholarships to get students an opportunity to come and integrate, um, really be a part of the community. Um, we're also um, trying to get engaged with academic research. Uh, so, you know, looking at the, the, the you know, the ever expanding number of universities that are now really getting into, you know, very heavy, heavy cybersecurity programs, um, all the way up to the PhD level. I, I teach at a university now, we have two PhD programs in cyber ops and cyber defense. Um, yes, we have adopted uh, DOD type terminology there. Um, the other is to develop some material for instructional use. So trying to get content for, um, for not only you know, faculty and instructors at a, maybe a high school level into, into a college level to use in their classroom, but then also as an opportunity for students to get hands on and start learning, not just about you know, Suricata as an engine, but then also um, you know, about open source software and about the open community. Um, so those are, you know, really some of our, our, you know, in terms of academics anyway, some of our biggest objectives. Um, we do want to begin to expand the community involvement. Um, as, as Victor had just mentioned, we are experimenting a lot right now with uh, really where does that community meet, um, especially in a virtual space. And so that's been a bit of a of a, of a holdup and, and that we don't want to create one venue to start building a you know a community around academics and then have to just uh, transfer it over to another platform a little bit later. Um, so it's been a bit of a hold, but it's also been a bit of a struggle because um, it's, uh, you know, universities, uh, there's no, you know, there's no Twitter hashtag that I can use to communicate with every university or every student on the planet. Um, and so building those relationships has also been a bit of a challenge, but you know the idea is we get these uh, these you know this this opportunity for this community to start to come together, and slowly over time it will build and and gain a bit of self sufficiency uh, in terms of the health and the productivity and the things that we can accomplish. Um, very similar to the overall mission or goal of Suricata as an open community. Um, I think that's good for me there, Victor. Right. Ah, okay. Sorry, I I didn't keep up. All right, let's go to present day. Um, Suricata. <clears throat> I'll try to be a bit quicker. Hey, uh, so we have about five minutes before we should move into Q and A. Okay. Sorry, uh, <laughs> I'm not listening to you. Um, so we have uh, about twelve and a half years behind us now, and I think that's pretty much 
bringing us into the sort of mature project kind of space. Although, you know, we're still a baby compared to Zeke and, uh, and to a lesser extent, Bro, uh, Snort, of course, because these projects are, are a lot older. Um, but I think we, we're getting there. And uh, uh, the biggest complaint we, complaint we get is uh, more we want more performance. Uh, so last week on the Zeek Sports uh, call, there was some mention of OSS Fuzz, the fuzzing program by Google. Um, so Zerkata recently joined and uh, our latest releases uh, contain the result of that. Um, it's, it's very useful. Um, uh, we see um, uh, it find so far mostly not very uh, important issues, but um, uh, definitely things that we want to fix. Um, so I think that's very useful and, and I uh, think that Zeke joining a program is, is a very good idea. So a quick thing about the whole COVID-19 thing where, um, you know, for us, I, I think the impact is pretty minimal um, because we were already a virtual team, mostly working from home. Uh, of course, the, the in-person trainings and such have been uh, uh, canceled and, and are, we are focusing more on virtual. Um, we have decided to keep uh, our old stable branch supported for a bit longer. Um, uh, so we kind of don't force people to, uh, to overextend in this time that's for many people kind of uh, hard and stressful. We will soon uh, make a decision about what to do about Suricon. It's in plan for November. Um, uh, it, it's, it's hard to decide what to do about it. Uh, can we organize it? What are the risks and all these things? So uh, we'll, we'll soon uh, make a decision and, and, and some announcement about this. Josh, you're back. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, so the, the, I guess the 30 seconds here, uh, as, as Victor mentioned, we were certainly seeing a, a pretty big change in um, you know, trainings and, and workshops and things that we've been, um, well, had planned for and, and traditionally been involved in. Um, you were, were moving a lot to, to virtual, and this was something that had always been on the, you know, the agenda to do. And, and now is an opportunity to just make it more of a reality um, and, and not just simply take a, you know, a two-day course and, and plug it into two eight-hour days of uh, virtual content, but, um, but to you know, really experiment with different formats and venues and, and breaking that up and getting people engaged. Um, our trainings uh, generally focus on the core of Suricata, uh, signatures, um, deployment configuration performance, and then something that we've been working on more recently here, threat hunting, um, just to highlight some of the capabilities that Suricata can do, as, as Victor has mentioned today. Um, some of the other areas, uh, and this is, I think, an opportunity for, for better community involvement, um, are webinars. Uh, so being an excellent opportunity such as this to join, um, we've also started doing our own and, and using those webinars as an opportunity to either, you know, pick specific topics and really focus in on them in regards to Suricata or, or NSM or IDS, um, or finding ways to get into uh, other communities. Uh, one of the first webinars we did was on integrating Cuckoo, um, Suricata with Cuckoo and some of the best practices there for performance and others. Um, we're also uh, looking to get more of our material on YouTube, recognizing that there is a generation uh, behind me at least, um, that uh, uses YouTube to find answers more than they use search engines. So, um, you know, trying to get the, uh, you know, the, the usability, that lesson, that, that, that learning curve um, to getting uh, hands-on with Suricata, using it, getting familiar with its capabilities, and, and then finding a use for it in, you know, hobbyist uh, lab environments or all the way up to the production, you know, uh, or enterprise settings. Thanks, Victor. Thanks. So looking ahead, um, we're planning to do a, a, a new major release in about two months, and uh, it's just going to be more, better, faster. Uh, hopefully, maybe your contribution. Um, I'm going to skip this, and I'm going to mention quickly that we are experimenting with a new uh, place um, to, for the community to get together a more modern for a, a version of what mailing lists are uh, which is our discourse. Uh, it's a forum that can be used as a mailing list quite nicely. And um, we're doing a trial. It's going really well. So I, I would be surprised if we're deciding to discontinue it. Um, so uh, that's really nice. I'm going to skip the chat. Uh, this is Josh again.
Uh, yeah, that, there's really nothing uh, new to add there. Um, if you're interested in anything, getting involved, chatting about ideas, uh, academic research, um, webinars, anything, please reach out to, to anyone on the team or myself. Uh, my email is at the beginning, and I think we'll make the slides available after the presentation. So thank you. Thank you. Um, what I would like to quickly go through before I'm done is uh, the, the opportunities for better and more uh, cooperation between Zeek uh, and Zerkata and the communities as well, uh, even though I think the communities largely uh, overlap. So um, we have the community flow idea effort that um, uh, Christian Krebich uh, uh, presented at Zurichon and, and he uh, spearheaded this. Um, I, I think this has been very well received and um, uh, is definitely something as Christian himself in his talk highlights is something that we can expand on. Uh, the first iteration uh, was rather simple, and, uh, and and so this is definitely something that I hope we can continue to work together on. Um, then everyone seems to be logging JSON these days, uh, and and of course everyone invented their own format. Uh, we tried initially to follow Splunk's uh, common information model. It was not a perfect fit, so we diver diverged, and I think Zeek has its own model. Elastic has its own model even when they do things with Sarkata, they, they relabel everything. Um, so I think there's an opportunity to work together somehow. Like, I don't know if that would be like converging all the formats to into one or maybe creating map mappings or documentations between all the fields so that people using the different tools can kind of uh, uh, do that in a more seamless way. Um, and then on the QA side, I think um, that uh, we've started to create uh, a much more structured testing uh, in a repository called Suricata Verify. And even though it's Suricata focused, it is essentially a set of PCAPs with, with a YAML uh, format label with it that of what is in the PCAP and what we care about. And uh, so I think this kind of effort might be able to be kind of uh, uh, put on a higher level with, with, with Seek and other tools as well so that we can uh, benefit from each other's uh, QA efforts. And then this is, kind of, I'm gonna just leave this right here. Um, we are thinking about lip Suricata and, and maybe Zeek could be using parts of Suricata that they care about, um, but that's just in a brainstorm phase. And with that, I would like to say, um, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Five minutes left. Well, all right, good job, Victor and Josh. Thanks a lot. There, we've been trying to answer some questions. You answered some questions uh, by, actually both of you answered some of the questions that came in, um, but we do have a couple others. One of them is from Don Thomas. He's asking if, if Rust has any impact on speed of input. So I'm guessing, does that have any impact on packet collection? Uh, so, so far we're not using it uh, in, in those lower levels. We're more using it in the higher level protocol dissectors. Um, there we've initially seen a minor impact, but um, we've, we've also seen other places where it's just really very fast. Um, so I think overall the impact is, is very, very minimal on, on the speed uh, and, and the, the, the stability gain that we get. and is, is uh, definitely worth it to us. Okay, cool. And uh, Josh, I think this one's for you. Have you thought about doing a Suricata 101 course for free so people can get enough knowledge to start trying it? Uh, yes, we, we have um, you know, kind of piecemeal at first. Uh, you know, some of the, the, the webinars, I think, are a good way to do that. Um, certainly, we have an aggressive plan to get more videos uh, on platforms like YouTube, um, although recording those uh, certainly takes some time and a bit behind that. Um, we do have an online training with uh, Chris Sanders and his Applied Network Defense. There is a, there is a cost to that, though, uh, but that is really designed as a, as a 101 level to get people um, you know, introduced to Suricata as a technology and then install and set up and off and running um, with capabilities and signatures and things. So, um, But again, there's a, a little bit of a cost to that. So those are our current solutions. Um, you know, if we certainly could get some more content in the hands of academics, I think that would also serve us um, well. But again, that's just a such a, um, there's just a lot that goes into developing good content. And so um, it's just taking a bit of uh, initial momentum to get that rolling. Cool. Okay, I don't think we have any other open questions. 
I have one though. Are there any ways that you've seen people using suricata where you thought, oh, why are they doing that? Like trying to shoehorn it into a place that maybe it's not appropriate for, or perhaps onto a platform? Because you, you see this quite a bit with some of the like micro or embedded systems. I, I often wonder, is that really the best way to be running that software? Uh, that's a good question. <clears throat> Nothing comes to mind immediately. Um, we, where I guess one of the places where I wonder why people use Suricata is, is in where they deploy it in a sort of uh, fire and forget mode where they just install it and then, um, and then never really look at it anymore. And those are the people who are still running very much outdated versions of, of Suricata, for example. And um, they don't normally get into touch with us because they don't touch it anymore. Um, but we see, for example, the emerging threats folks can see what version of Suricata uh, the rules, uh, what version of the rules are, are being pulled. And they still see people on those, those probably never touched again machines. And that's really where I wonder, like, why are you, <laughs> are you using Suricata in this, in this way and in this place? But yeah, um, yeah it's not right. no juicy story, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, I've got a, a question that uh, Kelly uh, reminded me we have to ask. Um, since Suricata can trigger on both packets and flows, does it track a flow uh, after a rule fires on a packet? Uh, so Suricata for most uh, packet types will track a flow as soon as it sees a packet. Um, and then when a rule fires, it will still continue to track the flow and store some state in there. Uh, Suricata will also at the end of the flow when it times out or is, is complete will uh, be able to log it and, and will for example be able to in, in the log tell you that it had alerts in, in there. Um, uh, so the flow tracking is, is independent of the rule language and the, the rule hits. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Here, we'll, let's sneak one more in while we still have to, uh, like 30 seconds. How do you see an intrusion detection implementation in a Docker environment? at the network edge or at each Docker host? I think it could be both. Um, it, it, it could be a, a very easy way to, to deploy. Like uh, instead of installing an RPM, you just pull a Docker image and then it, it mostly just works. Uh, uh, I am interested in, in the idea of running it on host itself. Um, I think it, it could be, Suricata is mostly designed to sort of own the hardware. Um, so we can do pretty much claim everything on the, on the system. And uh, if you run on a host, that's uh, obviously not acceptable. Um, so it, it would probably require some tuning, but I don't see any problems with it. It should provide value um, just the same. Cool. All right, well, Victor, Josh, Kelly, thank you so much from the, uh, the Zeke community side for joining us on these. I guess today was a Zeke at home. There's so many of these webinars now, I have to keep track of which one we're doing on any particular day. But thank you so much, wonderful presentation. And Kelly told me that um, she will make the slides available. So we'll figure out how to do that for yep, people who are absolutely. on the call. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us and we'll definitely keep in touch. Thank you for the invitation and I, and I hope that collaboration ideas and maybe others can uh, can lead to some good things as well. Yeah, love it. Thanks Richard. Thanks, bye everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.